Cheating is the stupidest and most unjustified risk that one of the spouses can take. Do you know why? Because in the end, everyone remains unhappy. The wife cheated on her husband but decided to confess a year later she did not think about what consequences this could lead to. You must be Mrs. Brown. Please call me Sandra and you're Mark, right? That's correct. So Sandra, what's the urgency? You mentioned on the phone that it's a matter of life and death. Yes, it is. Not mine, but someone I know. A man. I understand you've been counseling my husband? Yes, on and off for the past 10 years. I want to emphasize that as military psychologists, we adhere to the same code of ethics as civilian counselors. I can't disclose specifics of our sessions. 10 years, that's quite a long time. I didn't realize. I knew he was in the army, but military counseling? Once in, never out, is our motto. Your husband served as a sniper in an infantry regiment. We often see them here at the clinic. Unlike most soldiers who may never see the impact of their actions, snipers have a different experience. They see their targets up close, know who they're hitting, and witness the consequences. So, Dave, did he eliminate people? Mark noticed the sudden pallor in the woman's face, clearly frightened. He offered her a glass of water before continuing. Oh, definitely, Sandra. And it wasn't just soldiers, either. You're aware of the conflicts the Australian Army faced during the recent Middle East engagements. It wasn't a straightforward scenario of one uniformed side shooting at another. The majority of the adversaries were dressed as civilians, and uh, they didn't hesitate to involve people in delivering grenades and rockets. Your husband's responsibility was to provide protection to his company from all threats, if you catch my drift. Sandra deciphered the implications behind the words of the counselor in military attire and understood why her quiet, kind husband had required support. Yet, it was unsettling how much she remained unaware of about him. Dave never discussed his experiences there with me. He really wanted to, needed to, actually. But from what he's told me, you've been quite absorbed in your own troubles lately, and he didn't want to burden you with his issues. Is that why you're here to see me? He mentioned that your problems seemed to be resolving, and he was planning to open up to you. I've done everything I can. Now he needs someone he loves, and who loves him, to confide in. He needs acceptance. He was eagerly anticipating that from you. I can assure you. I don't think I'm violating confidentiality by saying that carrying all that pain was really taking a toll on him. Um, no. Can you tell me... Has he mentioned me recently? No, I haven't seen him in about a month. Well, goodness, this is quite embarrassing. What if I gave him some upsetting news? Could he react violently? He mentioned threatening to harm someone close to me. I need to know, is he serious? I'm walking a fine line here, Sandra. But without knowing the specifics, my initial reaction would be no. Dave's response to his military experiences, if anything, made him more gentle than before. It had to be serious enough to provoke a return to his past, to a time when he had to neutralize without hesitation to protect what he valued above all else. Can you share what the troubling news was? I have plenty of time. I don't have any more clients, and my wife is away this week. He patiently awaited as a flurry of emotions danced across the captivating woman's face like a shifting kaleidoscope. Beneath it all, pure, unfiltered terror lurked. He inferred that whatever she had to disclose was deeply humiliating, yet her desire for peace of mind was undeniable. Finally, I'm not sure what Dave may have mentioned about me, my issues. Just begin at the beginning, Sandra, from when you first met him until he allegedly made this threat. I met Dave eight years ago. I was instantly convinced he was my soulmate. We tied the knot within a year. At the time I was waitressing, but always harbored ambitions for a career. Dave supported me in completing the degree I had to abandon due to financial constraints. We had an informal agreement that I would work for a few years before starting a family, something we both desired. Everything went according to plan until a couple of years later, my mom got breast cancer. 
She couldn't cope with the disease. Dave was great. He helped me get through it all. I suppose that's what you wanted when you said that he was so concerned about my support that he didn't have a chance to talk about his past, about his problems. Mark nodded and waited. I was tested for the breast cancer gene and I had a positive result. Despite the fact that my mother detected the disease early, it was already too late. Dave supported my decision to have a double mastectomy. I couldn't take the risk. Since it was considered a planned operation, our insurance did not cover it. Dave made sure that I had the best surgeon and covered the financial losses when my savings became scarce. Sandra paused, old wounds resurfacing. Was it difficult? Incredibly. Despite counseling before the surgery, it didn't hit me until afterward. I felt like I lost my womanhood. Intimacy with Dave was non-existent for a long time. I couldn't bear the idea of him seeing or touching me naked. Thoughts of having children were put on hold as I tried to cope. Yes, Dave mentioned that period. He understood. Not many women have someone as patient and understanding as him. Sandra's gaze dropped, the truth of the statement weighing heavily on her troubled conscience. The therapist encouraged her to continue. So, you made the decision to undergo breast reconstruction? Yes. We couldn't afford it, but Dave refinanced his house to cover the expenses. He wanted me to maintain the same size I was before. He said he loved me just the way I was, but I opted for a slight upgrade. I was barely a B cup before, but I went for a full D. I had the procedure about eight months ago. I was in discomfort for a couple of months, which meant poor old Dave still didn't get any attention, but it did give me the confidence to return to work. I even got promoted. Sandra paused again, lost in thought. Mark thought it might be helpful to provide some additional context. Yes, this was when Dave began coming to see me once a week. His own issues were worsening as he focused on supporting you. He was really looking forward to you getting better so he could address his own problems. You must have noticed something. Well, in hindsight, he did seem a bit down for the last month or so, and his nightmares became so severe that I suggested he sleep in the spare room. The counselor's impression that this woman was entirely self-centered was solidifying. He redirected the conversation back to the main point. He had everything planned, you know. He was going to rent a cabin in the woods for a week and open up. How did that go? Mark's gut twisted as he watched Sandra's chin tremble and tears cascade down her cheeks. He allowed her a moment to collect herself. So, this all happened earlier this week. He was acting strangely, but he took a week off from work and we left last Friday. He seemed disappointed that I only agreed to go for the weekend. And did he confess? Did he talk about the incident when he... No. He seemed like he wanted to discuss something, but I spoke first. Can I assume that what you disclosed to him is why we're here today? Sandra nodded. Mark observed the telltale signs of guilt, though Sandra felt compelled to articulate them herself. He waited. It was clear Dave hoped we'd rekindle our relationship, you know, as husband and wife on Friday night. He prepared a wonderful dinner, lit candles, the whole works. But I just couldn't. Mark stayed silent, anticipating the inevitable and unsettling confession he knew was coming. I mentioned to you before that I had the surgery eight months ago and was in pain for a couple of months afterward. Even after the pain subsided, I didn't sleep with my husband because, well, because my lover advised against it. Sandra avoided meeting Mark's gaze. She dreaded the judgment she might or should encounter in his eyes. Yet it wouldn't have made much of a difference. Mark, seasoned by the grim realities of his profession, was adept at concealing his own emotions. When I confided in him, telling him about the harrowing experience when he had to neutralize a civilian who seemed about to attack soldiers under Dave's protection, Mark remained stoic. It was necessary for his patience. Now Sandra found herself in the same seat Dave had occupied during that conversation. Perhaps Sandra should have summoned the courage to look up. The turmoil in her own mind was already overwhelming. The weight of her betrayal had haunted her conscience. But now, realizing her husband had been wrestling with his own inner demons, it felt suffocating. The silence stretched on, 
uncomfortably prolonged. I saw the preparations Dave had made at the cabin, and I knew I had to intervene, she finally spoke, breaking the silence. I had planned to confess eventually, but I couldn't wait. I had to do it then and there. I couldn't find a valid reason to deny him intimacy. I'm just fortunate he hadn't pressed me sooner. After all, the discomfort from my surgeries had dissipated months ago. Sandra fell silent once more, prompting Mark's impatience as he grew increasingly contemptuous of her. His empty stomach reminded him he hadn't eaten since breakfast. What was the important news, Sandra? Feeling the need to justify herself, Sandra paused to gather her thoughts and choose her words carefully. After getting breast implants, I started getting a lot of male attention. It's amazing what a difference two cup sizes can make to some men. There was this guy I met through a friend. His name is Joe. Actually, never mind his name, Sandra said. Mark couldn't help but notice Sandra's peculiar glance over her shoulder at the empty parts of his room at this moment. It struck him as odd. We started talking. Initially, it was just when we were hanging out with friends. Then it became just the two of us. He confided in me about his mother's passing from breast cancer, which struck a chord with me since I had a similar experience. We discovered we had a lot in common. I began finding reasons to avoid Dave, saying I had to work late or had other plans on weekends. He trusted me and never probed deeper. Mark couldn't help but notice Sandra's apparent discomfort at betraying a good man's trust. A personal tragedy can create distance between people. Despite Dave's support during my mother's illness and my own health concerns, I felt he couldn't fully comprehend my feelings. But then, this other person, he seemed to understand me on a deeper level, as if he could anticipate my thoughts. Our bond grew stronger. Sandra paused to wipe her tears. Mark interjected, growing impatient. When did all of this happen, Sandra? I met him about six months ago. So, around a month after your surgery. Hmm. Well, I suppose I don't need to hear more about your connection with this person. It's clear you engaged in an emotional affair. Thankfully, it didn't escalate to physical intimacy. From what Dave has shared with me about you, I know you both agreed to discuss divorce before seeking physical intimacy with others. Mark felt a chilling sensation as he heard the sudden sob from the woman seated before him. He was aware of Dave Brown's troubled state and assumed his wife understood it too, even without the specifics. Could she really inflict such pain on him? Awful thoughts screamed in Mark's mind, leaving him speechless and struggling to maintain his professional composure. Sandra continued to sob, her face buried in the floor. It was time to address the issue at hand. Mark had a duty to the army and to Dave. Sandra, tell me exactly what you said to Dave at the cottagey. His authoritative tone left no room for defiance. Sandra replied automatically. I wasn't prepared for that conversation on Friday. I decided to accelerate my plans on the spot. And I told Dave I no longer loved him and wanted a divorce to marry someone else, um, my soulmate. How did he react? Specifically, he became distant and expressionless. He said he thought he was my soulmate. Then he asked if I had slept with the other man. Mark's increasing dread escalated as he pondered the significance of the woman's response to her husband. He understood the weightiness of the situation. What did you tell him, Sandra? I, I couldn't. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I couldn't inflict that pain on him. So I said nothing. But I think he figured it out anyway, that I'd been involved with John. We were in love. Dave just turned away from me. I think he might have been crying. I waited for him to process everything so we could discuss our separation. After giving him what felt like five minutes, I was about to broach the subject when he looked back at me. It was terrifying. It wasn't Dave looking at me. Not a single familiar gesture or expression. Even his eyes seemed a different color. Mark noticed Sandra shiver, choosing to stay silent, unable to find the right words. And when he finally spoke, his voice was like the lid being lifted off a stone sarcophagus. It was chilling. What did he say, Sandra? Please be specific. Can you recall his exact words? Oh, I remember vividly. It's why I'm here. 
What? As I said, he seemed like a completely different person, someone I didn't recognize. You have no idea how right you are about that. Sandra continued as if Mark hadn't spoken. It was terrifying. He just stared at me with those lifeless eyes and asked, Do you think I'll let you ride off into the sunset with Loverboy and live happily ever after? There's nowhere in this country or anywhere else that the wife-stealing jerk can hide. I'll track him down and eliminate him. Then he demanded to know my lover's name, but I remained silent. He simply snatched my phone and drove away, leaving me stranded without a car at that cabin in the woods. It took me six hours to make it back home. Some of Dave's belongings were missing, and upon checking I found that all our bank accounts had been closed and none of my cards were functional. I can't call John to warn him. His number was saved in my phone, but I can't recall it. I'm not concerned about the call log exposing John to Dave, as I rarely contacted him from my cell or home phone. His name is buried among 40 or 50 others. I'm hesitant to reach out to our mutual friends to relay a message to John, fearing Dave might be monitoring me somehow. I suspect he's keeping an eye on the house. I can't even go to John's place to warn him. I feel trapped and clueless about what to do. I can't reach out to my soulmate without putting him in danger from my husband. I'm terrified that John might show up at the house after failing to get in touch with me. That's why I've come to you. I want to see John, but I can't do it without jeopardizing his safety. Should I be afraid? Is Dave capable of following through with his threats? Sandra paused, her eyes wide and imploring as she looked at the counselor silently hoping he would spare her from having to make the most agonizing decision of her life, to never see her soulmate again. Still, he was willing to choose this path rather than risk her lover being neutralized by an enraged husband. She knew she would never find true happiness with anyone else for as long as she lived. Mark's professional demeanor faltered, his voice betraying his despair as he envisioned all his efforts with Dave Brown dissipating before his eyes. I believe there is a strong chance that such a shock could trigger him to revert back to his sniper mentality. He'll feel compelled to protect his team, which includes you and himself, by eliminating your lover. And I suspect he'll find it somewhat comforting, almost therapeutic, to seek vengeance. A sudden surge of anger consumed Mark as he glared at Sandra with condemnation. Years of painstaking work to rehabilitate Dave Brown into a productive, balanced member of society had been undone in just six months and one conversation by the selfish woman standing before him. His usual professional detachment crumbled. Over time, he had developed a deep bond with his patient and had believed they were nearing the end of their journey. Now all of that lay shattered in the dust. You foolish, self-absorbed person, what have you done? I'm amazed your spouse didn't immediately react with violence. Only his lingering affection for you could have prevented it. And as for the despicable individual who contributed to breaking Dave's heart, I wouldn't bet a penny on them lasting 30 minutes once Dave discovers their whereabouts. Leave my office this instant, you disgraceful person. Excuse me, you can't address me in such a manner. I can address you however I please. You didn't come here as a patient. But as a private citizen. You've likely ruined one of the most honorable men I've ever known, simply because you couldn't keep your promises or control yourself. When he left here last time, Dave was full of vitality like never before. And now you've ruined him. The woman with the pale face remained seated, staring at him in disbelief. Her hesitation in leaving allowed him to calm down. As she opened the door, he felt compelled to offer her some advice. You're in serious danger. Once Dave finishes falling out of love with you, he may lash out. You should hope he finds your lover first. Perhaps then his sense of justice will be satisfied before he comes for you. Personally, I believe you deserve whatever consequences come your way. I hold you in contempt. Sandra felt her head swimming as she leaned against the doorframe. It wasn't just the realization of the danger she and John were in that drained her. It was also the unsettling feeling she sensed from a supposed healer. She was shocked to see how her disclosure had shaken his professional demeanor. Stumbling out of the office, she prayed her car had enough gas to carry her home. Despite the counselor's reassurance, Sandra never feared Dave personally. Her fear was solely for John. 
yet her guilt gnawed at her. Seeking solace, she reached for the top shelf of the liquor cabinet. As the warmth of the drink began to soothe her, she longed to hear her lover's voice. But the idea of endangering him froze her in place. If she didn't reach out soon, he'd come looking for her, risking exposure if Dave had them under surveillance. Saving him meant contacting him, yet contacting him meant risking his safety. It was a catch-22 situation. She mentally reviewed all the potential ways to contact him once more. Calling John directly wasn't an option. Firstly, she couldn't recall his number and typically relied on her contacts list for that. Moreover, he didn't have a landline and mobile numbers weren't available through directory inquiries. Besides, if she called him from her landline and Dave happened to be monitoring it somehow, it could spell trouble. Reaching out to a mutual friend of hers and John's to relay a message was out of the question too. It would only lead Dave straight to John if he was eavesdropping. Visiting John's place was quickly dismissed as the riskiest idea. After two strong drinks, a solution emerged seemingly out of nowhere. It was remarkably simple, so much so that it hadn't immediately occurred to the modern woman of the 21st century. Grabbing a pen and paper, she opted for the old-fashioned method. She wrote John a letter. To suppress her emotions, she continued drinking. Just before she passed out on the couch, she sealed the letter in its envelope and addressed it. She would discreetly buy a stamp and mail it tomorrow. Three days later, with a mix of anger, frustration, and a hint of fear, John tossed the letter onto the floor. It had awaited him in the mailbox upon his return from a week-long trip. Seething, he reached for the same brand of sherry that Sandra had drowned herself in the night she wrote the letter. Recalling the contents of Sandra's message, and casting a wary glance at the darkness beyond his lounge window, he closed the blind. Then, grabbing both the open letter and the open bottle, he headed to the kitchen to contemplate his next move. Taking a swig from the bottle, he began to reread the letter. My dearest John, I'm writing to inform you of the disastrous events that have unfolded since last Friday. I fear they may spell the end for us, and we may never cross paths again. Upon arriving home last Friday, I discovered my husband had prepared a bag for me and whisked us away to a cabin he had rented in the woods. He had gone to great lengths to create a romantic retreat, clearly hoping to reignite our intimacy. However, I simply couldn't betray you in that way. It felt like cheating. I confessed everything to him. About us. Our love. How we complement each other's very beings. I pleaded for a divorce so that we could be together indefinitely. He fell silent, and I knew deep down he wouldn't take it well, but I had hoped he might acquiesce for my happiness. Instead, he asked if I had cheated on him. Caught off guard, I couldn't deny it, and he realized the truth. That's when he threatened to hunt you down and harm you. The anguish in his eyes made it clear he was serious. He abandoned me at the cabin, taking my cell phone with him. If you receive any calls or messages from him or anyone unfamiliar, pretend we have a vague acquaintance from work or elsewhere. Upon returning home, I discovered our funds depleted and cards canceled. I've been scraping by with what little was in my purse and what I've borrowed from friends. I'll be back on my feet after my next paycheck. Dave seems to have influenced some of my friends, as I've received a few harsh messages from them. On Monday, I found out that Dave was seeing a therapist because of his military experience. I consulted his therapist to assess the threat to you, and he confirmed it. It appears Dave may have been affected psychologically by his time in the Middle East. My love, I am utterly ashamed to have placed you in danger like this. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me, as everything I did was with the intention of securing our eternal happiness together. Sweetheart, it seems we have two options. Firstly, you could embrace the risk, come to me, and together we could either flee to safety or face the world openly despite the danger. Alternatively, you might devise a plan to neutralize Dave's threat. Unfortunately, I'm at a loss for solutions in that regard. Lastly, you could deem the risk too great, leading us to part ways indefinitely. I mention this knowing it would be incredibly difficult for you, my love. If your feelings for me even remotely match mine for you, the mere thought of separation would be unbearable. The one silver lining in our situation is that I can now proudly wear the engagement ring you gave me. I cherish it as much as I cherish you. If the worst should occur, I'll always have it as a reminder of our love. 
please consider carefully, my beloved John. I pray you find a resolution, but if not, I'll accept our parting as the price of your safety. Farewell for now, and perhaps forever, my dear John. I love you dearly. Yours always, Sandra. John angrily tossed the letter aside once more. He was resolved to pursue option three, escaping and doing so swiftly, perhaps as soon as tomorrow. Damn Sandra's husband, especially considering all the effort he'd invested in manipulating that clueless woman. Having never attended college, John had learned early on how to leverage his charm and skills in bed to supplement his meager earnings as a salesman. He had mastered the art, identify a wealthy wife, charm her, make her believe she was his soulmate, orchestrate her divorce and claim as much of her money as possible. His bank account boasted a healthy six-figure sum. Like any successful salesman, John understood the importance of research. Utilizing mutual acquaintances, he gathered extensive information about Sandra, even down to her favorite drink. Learning of her deceased mother, a bit of basic research on breast cancer provided him with enough knowledge to feign empathy, claiming his own mother had suffered from the disease. Establishing this shared bond, he drove a wedge between Sandra and her husband, convincing her that he understood her better and loved her more. After establishing an emotional connection, persuading her to betray her husband and join him in bed was surprisingly straightforward. He had nearly reached the point of disclosing her affair to her oblivious spouse himself, when, during his absence while focusing on his next target, the foolish woman revealed everything. Well, it's my own fault for being too greedy, he reflected. However, the new target was promising, wealthier, more attractive, and, crucially, more susceptible than Sandra. She would likely succumb to his tactics soon enough. It was a method that seldom failed and incurred minimal costs. Sure, he had endured a few punches and broken noses from enraged husbands over the years, but it often drove a wedge between spouses and sometimes resulted in the wife receiving a larger portion of the marital assets if her husband ended up behind bars. John harbored no guilt about his actions. After all, female gold diggers had existed since time immemorial. Nonetheless, it irked him that he would need to vacate his bachelor pad tomorrow and hastily relocate elsewhere. This new target seemed like he could be unstable. However, this might actually work to his advantage. It placed him closer to the woman in the neighboring town whom he had been grooming for weeks. That's where he had been spending all his time lately. He was on the verge of seducing her, knowing that once it happened, her marriage would be effectively over. He understood that juggling multiple targets simultaneously was greedy and hindered his ability to thoroughly research each one, but it promised substantial rewards. In a sense, cutting ties with Sandra simplified things. Nevertheless, he was annoyed at the amount of time and effort he had wasted. Setting aside the irrelevant letter, John poured himself another drink as his thoughts drifted back to a memory from earlier that day. He met a woman who looked very much like the girl with whom he had his first bed experience. It wasn't her, just a look-alike. Nonetheless, it stirred up fond memories. He decided to search for her in his old high school yearbook. John had lived a minimalist life, eschewing possessions in favor of mobility. Despite this, he held on to a select few personal items. His childhood scrapbook, his scout scarf, and his old yearbook. Retrieving his belongings from atop the bedroom cupboard, John carried them to the kitchen table. With both hands, he flattened the scrapbook and blew away the dust, eagerly anticipating a journey down memory lane. As the dust dispersed, it revealed something that initially puzzled John, then filled him with dread. Strangely, he didn't feel the urge to flee, nor did he consider fighting. He knew instinctively that escape was futile. All he could do was gaze at the red laser beam now visible amidst the sparkling motes of dust, a beam emanating from outside, penetrating the kitchen window at a 30-degree angle and converging on his chest. Dave's Conclusion Years later, Dave Brown still found the absurd image he had glimpsed through the scope of his illicit rifle to be one of the most amusing he had ever encountered. It wasn't just the sight of blood draining from the target's face or the sudden release of a book from limp hands. It was also the surreal experience of watching the target crumble to its knees, his elevated position allowing him to witness the telltale stain spreading across the front of the trousers as the mark involuntarily lost control. The turmoil raging within Dave Brown's mind since his bitter betrayal by his wife was so immense that mere words could not capture its magnitude. 
his guilt over his actions during his service in the Middle East, and the atrocities he had been compelled to commit, had reached a breaking point in recent months, evidenced by his relentless nightmares. But there was another layer of guilt as well. Keeping his full history from Sandra, the most important person in his life, meant she could never truly know him. He felt as though he were hiding a crucial part of himself from her. For what felt like an eternity, he had yearned to pour out his heart, yet he had held his tongue, mindful of her recent suffering. He compared his inner turmoil to a festering wound, desperate for relief. He needed to lance it, to purge the poison with words, words that he needed Sandra to hear. Until recently, he couldn't bring himself to do it, unwilling to burden her further. But as he sensed her growing strength, he braced himself mentally and physically to reveal his true self, flaws and all. As he spent weeks preparing for his confession, the anticipation of the catharsis it would bring consumed him. Yet, he also feared her rejection upon learning his truth. His astonishment was profound when she preempted him, laying bare her own secrets, leaving him stunned. The details of his emotions and words before fleeing the cabin eluded him, overshadowed by the overwhelming urge to escape or confront the source of his anguish. In the ensuing hours, a singular emotion consumed him. Revenge. His world had been under attack, and he felt compelled to defend it at any cost. Though the urge to destroy Sandra gnawed at him, a flicker of the love he once felt for her remained, albeit fading with each passing day. The woman who betrayed her and the love they shared became a prime target. Thus, he employed his skills as a sniper, his chosen role in the army, where individuals were carefully selected for their aptitudes. Patience and craftiness were essential qualities for a sniper. With no leads from Sandra's contacts and a reluctance to interrogate her friends, Dave blended into the cityscape, observing his former lover, hoping she would lead him to his target. He trailed her to the counselor's office but refrained from approaching Mark afterwards. If the counselor fulfilled his duty, he might have alerted the authorities about a potential threat within their ranks. Instead, Dave followed the betrayer back to their home, maintaining his surveillance. Later that night, sneaking into his old residence, the sniper uncovered crucial information by reading an unsealed letter from Sandra's purse, confirming his target. Retrieving his rifle, he embarked on his hunt. For three days, he patiently concealed himself in the bushes near the target's house, only venturing out at night for sustenance, awaiting the perfect moment to strike. Three days gave Dave plenty of time to think, and he thought about every aspect. He reflected on the satisfaction he could get if he punished the man who stole his wife, imagining a quick reprisal, as well as strategies to avoid a life sentence. He reflected on the empathy he had put into his marriage over the years, combined with the pain of betrayal and the breakup of what he had once considered a strong partnership. When he saw the pathetic figure kneeling in his kitchen, in a puddle of his own yellow liquid, he was overwhelmed by a wave of new thoughts that crossed out the expectation of three days ago. Ultimately, this man was not worth the cost. Dave realized the value of any life, even the lives of despicable individuals. When his old sense of camaraderie was destroyed, Dave no longer felt the need to protect his former team. Now he was a loner, and his only task was self-preservation. By loosening the trigger tension, he secured the weapon, destroying all traces of his presence before disappearing into the night. His steps filled with a newfound lightness, accompanied by a sense of pride in overcoming inner turmoil. Sandra's Conclusion Following the mailing of her letter to John, Sandra found herself consumed by fear for her lover's safety. Each day after work, she hurried home, anxiously checking her landline for any messages, worried that John might have left his name on one. She had no control over whether he did the same with her cell phone still in Dave's possession. She began hovering between the phone and the front door, eager to intercept any calls before John could leave his name and ready to usher him inside to safety. As the expected delivery date of her letter to John approached, Sandra grew increasingly hopeful. She was convinced that John's love for her would outweigh any concerns for his safety. In her romanticized imagination, the worst outcome she could envision was a tragic end, where she and John perished together, caught in the crossfire of her unstable ex's violence, a scenario almost reminiscent of a Shakespearean tragedy. 
Three days passed without Sandra hearing anything from John, despite expecting a letter. Her hope that his return from his recent sales trip might have been delayed began to fade. Two possibilities emerged. Either Dave had already retaliated against John, or John's fear had overridden his love. Sandra couldn't determine which scenario was worse as she anxiously checked every available news source for reports of attacks on local men. As it became evident that Sandra had lost John's affection, her remaining friends grew concerned for her, aside from those who had distanced themselves due to her betrayal of David. Two of them invited her to a bar where they introduced her to Susan, a new acquaintance. After a few drinks, Sandra became emotional, questioning how a man who had bought her such an expensive ring, a full one-carat diamond, no less, could abandon her so easily. When Susan examined the ring, she became noticeably quiet. After much prodding, she revealed that as someone who worked in a jewelry shop, she knew its true value. An authentic 18-carat gold ring with a one-carat diamond was worth thousands, while a gold-plated ring with a convincing cubic zirconia was worth only a fraction of that. In a state of extreme embarrassment, Sandra hastily left, got into her car, and drove towards home, only to encounter a police checkpoint for alcohol testing. Despite her initial anger fueling her, she was soon confronted by a police officer who informed her of her rights and arrested her. After being processed, charged, tested, and subsequently released, she experienced the shame of retrieving her car the next day. Her first destination was John's apartment, but finding it empty and seeing signs of a hurried departure intensified her frustration. Visiting John's alleged workplace, where they denied knowing him, further fueled Sandra's irrational anger. The realization of being deceived, despite her confidence in her intelligence, stoked her rage, which eventually turned into self-loathing. What she once deemed as justified actions against her husband now revealed themselves as despicable acts. Sandra came to realize, through her actions and the expression on Dave's face during their last encounter, that reconciliation was out of the question. Consequently, she opted to punish herself by refraining from contesting the divorce or making any claims on their shared assets. As a gesture to alleviate her guilt, she penned a lengthy letter of apology to Dave, wherein she divulged the complete details of her past affair. Secretly, Sandra harbored a hope that Dave would eliminate John in a manner that wouldn't implicate him, yet would allow her to express her contempt. With the expectation that Dave might still be keeping tabs on her, Sandra left the letter on the kitchen table. Over the ensuing week, Sandra's routine settled into a familiar pattern. She would labor through her day, her mind consumed by bitterness at feeling deceived. Returning home, she would find the letter undisturbed and proceed to drown her sorrows until her thoughts grew hazy. In this intoxicated state, she could convince herself that John had chosen her an exquisite ring, that she had misunderstood his profession, and that he was clandestinely plotting their escape. The subsequent hangover left her mired in conflicting emotions and confusion, before the cycle repeated itself anew. She hadn't seen John in a fortnight when she stumbled upon the solution to her dilemma. It was evident that John had vacated his apartment, but she had an alternative method of locating him. During their time together, he had insisted on installing Find a Phone software on both of their mobile devices. She pondered his intentions now. Did he do it to keep track of her proximity? Upon returning home one Friday to discover Dave's belongings gone, she also found her phone lying on the kitchen table. After charging it minimally, she checked for messages from John. There were none. Disregarding all other notifications, she experimented with the Find a Phone application and discovered that John's phone was 50 kilometers away in another town. Turning off her phone to conserve battery and conceal her approach from her target, she swiftly got into her car and set off. It was past eight in the evening when she powered her phone back on to pinpoint the exact whereabouts of her former love. It transpired to be an intimate little restaurant just beyond the city limits. Pacing around outside and peering through the windows, she spotted John seated in a secluded corner. He was opposite a stunning, elegantly dressed woman, closer to his age than Sandra was. A sizable gleaming engagement ring adorned the woman's left ring finger, alongside a flashy wedding band. Any doubts about John's feelings for Sandra were shattered when she witnessed him reaching across the table, 
grasping the woman's hands and gazing affectionately into her eyes. Sandra vividly recalled receiving such attention. The woman promptly withdrew her hands and anxiously scanned the room. Sandra also noticed something she hadn't observed before when she was out with him. Whenever the woman's attention drifted away, John's face would ease into a neutral expression, only to light up again with a radiant smile once her focus returned to him. Sandra came to the realization that the guy was a predator, deriving pleasure from seducing married women. She hadn't imagined the extent of it all. She hadn't fathomed that he purposefully destroyed marriages to lay claim to the divorce money. The thought would have only made her feel more foolish than she already did. She simply continued to gaze out the window, recognizing all the familiar maneuvers of the man. Realizing that he was in the midst of seducing his next target, Sandra was torn between jealousy and a desire to warn the woman about what she was getting herself into. She opted against confronting John and his target right then and there. With the fury coursing through her, she knew she'd likely be arrested for assault. No, she resolved. She'd wait until the woman was alone to inform her of the treacherous snake pursuing her. Sandra returned to her car and positioned it towards the exit before settling in to wait. As John escorted the attractive woman to her car, Sandra struggled to suppress the impulse to run him over. If she could have targeted only him, she might have succumbed to the temptation. The couple approached a Lexus parked adjacent to John's vehicle. In the dim light, Sandra observed John embrace the woman and share a passionate kiss. There was no sign of resistance from her. Judging from the apparent stage of their budding relationship, Sandra speculated that John would otherwise behave impeccably and refrain from making advances. He seemed adept at playing the long game. She observed him gallantly open the Lexus door for the woman and bid her good night, standing and waving until she was out of sight. Starting her own car, Sandra decided to tail his latest conquest. Her intention was to confront her with some home truths once they reached her residence. However, her plan went awry when the woman drove straight through a pair of opening iron gates leading to an opulent mansion. The gates nearly closed before Sandra could reach them. She watched as the car disappeared behind the vast house, several hundred meters beyond the gate. Sitting there, torn about her course of action, Sandra ultimately reasoned that she owed the woman only a small gesture, acknowledging their shared humanity. Retrieving the notebook Dave had left in the glove box to log car services, Sandra began to jot down the essential details. Despite the limited space, she stuck to the facts, witnessing the hand-holding and kissing, realizing she was John's final victim and the toll it took on her once happy marriage. After folding the pages, she pulled up alongside the mailbox and slipped them in before driving away, feeling a sense of relief, but also grappling with the realization of how easily she had been deceived. Her guilt over betraying Dave gnawed at her, challenging her belief in her own decency. To silence her inner turmoil, Sandra turned to alcohol, grappling with the knowledge that she had abandoned a good man who relied on her, all for nothing. Her work performance suffered and coupled with losing her license due to a DUI, she was fortunate to retain her job, albeit with a demotion. With finances dwindling, Sandra was forced to sell her house. In the sluggish market, she barely managed to break even on the transaction. The last thing she packed was an unopened letter addressed to Dave. Left without parents, being the only child in the family, with a thinning circle of friends, Sandra was distrustful of life in general and men in particular. She never trusted the intentions of men who showed interest in her. At one point, her lack of interest in men led her to believe that she might be of a different orientation. This belief persisted until the morning when she woke up with a hangover and realized that she had the taste of another woman in her mouth. Her waning self-confidence forced her to choose partners who were not suitable for her, convincing herself that she deserved the mistreatment they subjected her to. Some of them cheated on her, and she unconsciously rejoiced in the pain. By the time she found a friend who helped her change her life and find a decent man, it was too late for her to have children. She was content, but at the same time lonely, when her life came to an end. Sandra never encountered Dave in person again. All she discovered was returning home from work one day to find all his belongings gone, 
she never received any portion of their money. Ten years later, she did catch sight of a photo of him in the national media. It depicted him receiving a National Innovation Award. In the image, he appeared content and prosperous, with a smiling spouse and joyful children surrounding him. Sandra let out a sigh, mourning both the memories left behind and the comforting realization that she could finally cease looking over her shoulder for the first time since the unfortunate events of that month. John's Fate Regrettably for John, Sandra's hastily written note pushed through the letterbox of the mansion wasn't intercepted by his latest target as a cautionary message, but rather by her husband. This formidable husband, fueled by jealousy and having climbed the ranks in the construction industry, believed in resolving issues with his fists and steel-toed boots. When he came face to face with his wife, he forced her to tell him everything she knew about the predator. He subsequently forced her to schedule a meeting with John the next evening at a remote location, ostensibly to promote their romance. John was found the next day with serious injuries, and his dignity could not be restored. In their small district, a local journalist conducted thorough investigation into a significant story. The resulting publicity prompted some of John's previous victims to step forward. Weeks later, he found himself in the media spotlight. A comprehensive expose was published, detailing his methods, featuring interviews with several women he had deceived, destroyed their marriages, and exploited financially. Upon reading the article, Sandra realized she had been deceived. Though the police did not press charges for fraud, two of the more resilient victims took legal action to reclaim some of their losses. Let's just say, John no longer possesses a car or a six-figure bank balance. In fact, the remaining digits in his bank account barely reach four figures.